So slap me, Adam, if I use the term perfect storm, it's overused. <laughs> but the fact is we're seeing companies closing, bankruptcies re-erupting. What, we had 10 in the month of, of July, and we're on track to have 29 in August in terms of cl uh, uh, companies closing on a per diem basis, according to dailyjobcuts.com, which has been around since 2009, we had about four or five companies, locations closing per day uh, throughout the summer months. It's kicked up to nine per day in August. So we've seen a definite turn in terms of money that is coming out of the economy. You're, 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 taking away people's income producing capacity at the same time that the employee um, retention credit went from 30 billion in the month of July, an all time record being pumped into the hands of high net worth individuals. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary Wonderman. to right now we're running closer to $17 billion as, uh, as the IRS commissioner has come out and said, we're gonna get a hold of this and we have. In fact, we're speaking to Congress about stopping it. So things are changing and three different ways they're changing happen to be happening at one time. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder, Adam Taggart. Up until recently, runaway inflation was all anyone could talk about. Suddenly, now everyone is fixating on the surge in bond yields, worried that they'll continue moving even higher. Have we made a permanent shift to an era of higher cost of capital that will constrain economic growth? Or is this spike in yields a transitory one, and those hoping for a Fed pivot and a return to lower interest rates finally get their wish? For answers, we're fortunate to sit down with Danielle DiMartino Booth, CEO and Chief Strategist for Quill Intelligence. She was a former advisor to the Dallas Federal Reserve during the Great Financial Crisis, working with Richard Fisher, and she's author of the book Fed Up. Danielle, thanks so much for joining us today. Great to be back with you, Adam. Uh, you couldn't have any better timing right now with that question of yours. Great. Well, look, it's always a pleasure to talk with you, even more of a pleasure to talk with you about a timely topic. So let's jump right in. Before we get to bond yields, though, let me just uh, ask you the kickoff question I like to ask you at the beginning of every one of these discussions. What's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? So, um, you know, right now, I think the global economy is as close to being in recession as it's been pretty much since 08, 09. Uh, the differentiating factor that I would throw out there is uh, is that the Federal Reserve is not about to launch zero interest rate policy for the first time, and China is not an, about not about to spend enough money to pull the rest of the world out of its global recession. So, you know, I mean, that was one long sentence, but it says a lot. About yeah, our, our, our two normal saviors are not coming to the rescue. Exactly, exactly, and I think that that is the differentiating factor between then. And now they're completely separate from one another. But boy, do they get related when aggregated. All right. Um, well, look, uh, so we have this interesting moment in time here where I've, I've asked this question of a few folks recently. I'm, I'm dying to hear your answer. Um, so first off, you said we're basically on the precipice of recession, right? Which is interesting because you read the headlines and of course they dialed hard landing down to soft landing now to no landing at all, right? So it's certainly not a recession the markets are pricing in uh, at this point. But we've had on the monetary side, Jerome Powell and the Fed jamming the brakes, right? With this historically aggressive uh, rate hiking campaign while QT is going on. You have the banking system concurrently placing its foot on top of the Fed's foot on the brake, pushing down because they're tightening lending standards, um, mostly because they just want to protect themselves from, from bad loans, right? So that is pushing hard on the brakes. Yet over on the fiscal side, right, we're running one of the highest deficits we've ever run. Certainly on a, as a percent of GDP, it's one of the most aggressive you know, we've ever had. We've never had one this aggressive from that standpoint with unemployment this low. Um, so we have this very weird mismatch where the Fed, that we've got the monetary brakes being pumped while simultaneously we're jamming on the economic gas. What dynamic is this creating and how long can you do that before you start really having some, some big issues that, that are undesirable, like a resurgence of inflation from, from the fiscal stimulus? So I, I think that um, 
I think that there are, as you say, several dynamics. What what you didn't mention is that it, this is all dot, dot, dot in peacetime. So uh, right. historically- and, and I'm glad you said that, sorry to jump in, but I've said many times, in fact, in the intro to my last video, we have a wartime deficit in a peacetime economy. Exactly, exactly. And, and what's interesting is when you're running wartime deficits, all companies are lining up to do what they can to do their share for Uncle Sam, because it's the patriotic and the right thing to do. Because the Biden administration has has kind of handcuffed a lot of the initiatives that have come out with the Inflation Reduction Act, with e ESG and DEI initiatives, say what you will, but there are several well-known companies that have been burned recently by trying to cross the line into being political rather than to just serve their shareholders. So you're not going to have the same uptake as you would otherwise. Uh, but what we are seeing currently in the here and now is the vestiges of the infrastructure spending. And when you look at non-building, and that's actually a term, it, it means it means construction activity that doesn't actually create a structure, create a, a building that goes up, create a home that you that you that you're living in. But when you tangle that out of the Dodge construction data on a monthly basis, you're seeing that non-residential construction and residential construction are down year over year. But that's being almost fully offset by infrastructure type of spending. So that's a 12 to 18 month lag. And that's why we're seeing more stability than we would otherwise right now in the US economy. The reason I bring this up, Adam, is because there will be a lagged effect to the Inflation Reduction Act spending, which is the next big level of fiscal stimulus. We hear about it, the government is spending it, but we're not seeing it manifest yet in the US economy. But again, the recipients are not necessarily as you would have seen in wartime across the board. Some companies are some companies are going to stop back and say, step back and say, you know what, I don't want this funding. I don't want the the I don't want what's attached to it because I'm I, I live in fear of my shareholders revolting and or worse, the people who buy my products. So again, this is this is this is a transmission mechanism type of situation that I think people have to distinguish. When we were pumping wartime spending levels, when we were pumping $7.6 trillion into the economy on a trailing 12 month basis, as opposed to what we're doing right now, 6.7 trillion, I'm citing Michael Hartnett at Bank of, Bank of America data, that first huge push into the economy was bypassing the banking system and going directly into households checking accounts. That ignited real inflation. What we're seeing today though, it's going to go through companies and eventually to the end consumer, many of whom are going to be unionized employees. And it's not going to have the same immediate and direct and as I would say efficient impact if you're talking about fiscal policy transmitting to inflation. And that's why I follow this gauge called Trueflation. Uh, the people who, who run the, the, the gauge, they were kind enough to give me the data back to 2012 uh, when it first came out. If you look at, at, at the correlation, since it was introduced January of 2012, it has a 97% correlation with headline CPI. Well, guess what? It's ticked up quite a bit from about 2.1 to about 2.7 in very short order. But if you look inside the components of Truflation, that really is a gasoline prices at the pump situation. Whereas food prices are actually declining, of course, food prices are twice your input that energy are into the CPI. And shelter is declining as well. That's mainly an apartment story. And you're starting to see more and more references to apartments oversupply. We're starting to come to that recognition phase. Before it was just like, well, we've got a million units in the pipeline, and it was nice and theoretical to talk about. Now they're actually completed, and the units are opening and competing with existing multifamily units. So we are seeing that actual deflation come down the pipeline. Of course, that's 40% of your CPI. So I would argue that the fiscal stimulus is indeed something that has taken a lot of attention of investors, but by the same token, it will not act as immediately as what we saw with the pandemic crisis uh, response as we see. And I, 
I posit that while we'll have some base effects going into the fall in the inflation numbers, that the areas that are that, that are seeing disinflation and actual outright deflation apartment rents are going to be stronger. They're going to be a stronger drag on that, especially as we see the labor force continue to deteriorate, which is not a figment of my imagination, Adam. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to talk about that labor force in just a second. Um, let me let me just summarize what I think you said and correct me if it's wrong. Um, uh, you didn't say this specifically, but it's sort of what I'm taking away, which is the the jamming on the gas, right? This this substantial deficit spending that we're seeing has probably pushed forward in time or, or, or maybe back in time. So further into this year, maybe next year, the recession that we were all expecting at the beginning of this year. But what you're saying is, is as you look at the continuation of how the deficit money is being spent and some of the issues that you know, come with it, like companies maybe not wanting all the strings attached, maybe not wanting all that money necessarily. The lag effects of what the the monetary side of the house has been doing, raising cost of capital, you know, all that, as well as just a lot of the the really worrisome macro data that you and I spend a lot of our time worrying about. You think that lag effect is eventually going to overpower whatever potential stimulative inflationary effect of the remaining deficit spending is going to be. So even though we have cross currents, one of them stronger and is going to win out here in the story. Well, it certainly will be stronger if the Fed holds in place. And that really is all the Fed has to do. The Fed could theoretically later on in the fall, uh, there's a, somewhat of a 33 percent probability that before we ring the New Year's Eve bells uh, on January the 1st, 2024, there's about a 33% probability that we might see one more 25 basis point rate hike out of the Fed. But even that really isn't going to matter as much to commercial real estate deals that have to be refinanced. And then Beginning in 2024, the reality that runs parallel to that in the corporate bond market. And that starts to be something that is, is real. Companies have done a bang up job of, of extending out their maturities. They did that when the Fed was too low for too long. But you are there is irrefutable evidence in, in the bankruptcy cycle right now, in the default cycle, that a lot of companies simply cannot even contemplate looking at a higher cost of capital, running their companies. I, I dare say, and I, I hate to shoot myself in the foot here because I don't want people to disregard the bankruptcy cycle, but I think a lot of companies are being preemptive about filing for chapter 11. Seeing the writing on the wall over the next six months and the fact that it doesn't look like they're going to have any kind of a pivot that takes interest rates back down to the zero bound. And that's a lot different than saying, gee, I wonder if by June of 2024, Jay Powell is going to reduce interest rates by 25 basis points or 50 basis points. Completely different dynamic than what we've grown accustomed to with his, with his three predecessors. Okay. All right. So this is all a great segue into the topic I sort of teed up in the intro, right? Which is where are bond yields headed from here? And what will that mean for the bond market, for investors, but just for the economy with this higher cost of capital? A um, number of questions for you on this, but let me just start with, with what do you think is causing the sudden move higher in yields that we've seen you know, over the past month plus? Um, and, and if I can, I just interviewed Luke Roman, and I'll give you his list. And you can, you can see whether you agree with it or you pick anything else out from it. But he said in pretty short order, We've had four destabilizing events. We've had the price of oil increase by about 20%. Um, we had the, the Bank of Japan widen out its yield curve control efforts. We had the Fitch downgrade um, of the US's credit rating. Um, and we had the US Treasury announce that it's going to borrow $1.9 trillion in the second half of this year. And you know, Lucas said, okay, those, those have all sort of contributed to, to you know, the treasury buyers getting a little spooked and saying, hey, I want a higher yield to compensate me for this risk. Um, does that sum it up? Or are there other reasons why you think that, you know, we're now staring at what, a 4.3% uh, 10 year US treasury on the day that you and I are talking? So um, I, I think that is a good a good synopsis. But I, I venture to say that, that the Fitch downgrade is actually um, 
you, you should reflect back on what Fitch was trying to say and look at it relative to other countries and what their position is in terms of it being one of these four big ones, as Luke would have put out there. We actually had a full blown debate about this in my Bloomberg chat room with my institutional clients uh, just yesterday. And the only thing that we came up with as being kind of definitive for explaining this relatively inexplicable rise in, in, in inflation. Yes, we've seen a move in energy, but but Jay Powell has continued to, he's persistently said he's paying attention to core services and net of shelter, which means that he's drilling way down to determine how, how resolute he's going to be in his monetary policy stance. I think we all know that energy prices move, but they move the headline. And that's not what Powell's told us his focus is. But the Bank of Japan, that was the one that was the one aspect, the one factor that nobody could really put their finger on how big of, an, of a swing factor that it has proven to be here over the last few weeks. And I venture to say that that is the biggie. And it's also the least understood because, well, my gosh, how long have we been waiting for this moment? Um, so it's also the, the, the most difficult to determine what the outcome is going to be. But if you look at any gauge, of where the these bond yields are, they are so stretched vis-a-vis -vis historical norms, regardless of what other series you wanna slap up against them, that something tells you that right now, what we're seeing is a heck of a lot of positioning and a heck of a lot of jockeying, trying to get in front of the narratives that tend to rule the financial markets as opposed to the fundamentals. Okay, so all of a sudden, we're seeing, you know, this narrative erupt of, oh my God, yields are going to keep going higher. Like, you know, it seems like all of a sudden people are just now beginning to buy what Powell's been saying, you know, for, for a year and a half of higher for longer, right? But now they're taking the football and they're beginning to sort of catastrophize in their minds. So the morning you and I are talking here, there was a Bloomberg article that came out that said, hey, the federal funds rate might need to go up to 6%. Right. So all of a sudden, people are beginning to say, hey, you know, this thing could really take off from here. And you're beginning to see um, articles talking about how we're just in this secularly higher era of higher cost of capital now. And all of a sudden, it was all about pivot, 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 pivot. <laughs> and, and now it's like, wow, this this we might be stuck with these higher rates for a, a long time. And of course, that's now erupting a debate um, between whether bonds and specifically U.S. Treasuries, you know, are. I've got I've got basically just as many people on the side of saying this is a historically attractive time to buy U.S. Treasuries and this is the time to start going out on duration and you can make a ton of money while sitting in safety and getting paid. And then I've got about an equal number of people suddenly on the other side of that saying, oh, my gosh, they're like a roach motel. Why would anybody be going out long duration bonds if, if yields are going to be going higher from here for the long run? Um, do you have an opinion on, on what's more likely? I think you do, but I'll let you say it. <laughs> well, I, I do because I think that 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 fundamentals can be ignored for a very long time, uh, and I think that that certainly has been the case. And you know, kind of the the it's going to be a soft landing camp grew exponentially when there was a resolution to the debt ceiling that didn't involve bloodshed. So there was this massive relief that came about after the debt ceiling was resolved. And we're now waking up to the fact that, well, okay, how are we gonna finance it? And wait a minute, those people who were burned by the debt ceiling resolution have egg all over their face. And they really are angry, those on the far right. So good luck headed into October. Oh, and by the way, even though somewhere between 45 and 60% and of Americans who are, are supposed to resume repaying their student loans, even though 45 to 60% have no intention of doing that and have been surveyed across three, four different surveys as saying, I got it. It starts on October the 1st. I'm just going to disregard it because I can uh, you know, the others who plan on resuming repayment, that occurring alongside of a budget standoff with some pretty pissed off people on the far right, that's colliding with the honeymoon about the debt ceiling ending, the layoff cycle resuming in a very dramatic fashion in real time metrics on top of the IRS 
finally waking up and smelling the coffee. Now that a lot of these paycheck protection program scandals are breaking, people are going to jail uh, because of the fraud. The IRS is actually trying to get in front of the employee retention credit uh, uh, wave of fraud. And it, it's actually going to have a huge economic impact at the same exact time. So slap me, Adam, if I use the term perfect storm, it's overused. <laughs> but the fact is we're seeing companies closing, bankruptcies re-erupting. What, we had 10 in the month of, of July, and we're on track to have 29 in August in terms of cl uh, uh, companies closing on a per diem basis, according to dailyjobcuts.com, which has been around since 2009. We had about four or five companies, locations closing per day uh, throughout the summer months. It's kicked up to nine per day in August. So we've seen a definite turn in terms of money that is coming out of the economy. You're, you're, you're taking away people's income producing capacity at the same time that the employee um, retention credit went from 30 billion in the month of July, an all time record being pumped into the hands of high net worth individuals. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary Wonderman. to right now we're running closer to $17 billion as, uh, as the IRS commissioner has come out and said, we're gonna get a hold of this and we have. In fact, we're speaking to Congress about stopping it. So things are changing and three different ways they're changing happen to be happening at one time. All right. So a lot of body blows uh, set to hit the hitting or set to hit the economy in short order here. Um, you mentioned the um, you, and, and by the way, I should say all those are happening, too, at a time where national tax receipts are declining from where they were last year. Right. So expenses up receipts down. That's not a good equation. You mentioned the employee retention credit. Uh, I know you've been doing a lot of work around this. I don't think many people know what it is. I think I've mentioned it once briefly on this channel before. Can you just tell folks um, what exactly it is and, and why the statute just mentioned are important? Because it's a good example of that jamming of the fiscal accelerator of the economy that I think most folks didn't really even realize was going on. So think of think of the Paycheck Protection Program as, as the pint you order when you go into the pub. And we know that the fraud was into, God knows, the hundreds of billions and that we're, we're prosecuting that now and it's making a lot of headlines and, and good for prosecutors for rooting out the fraud. So think of the Paycheck Protection Program as the great big frothy Guinness pint you order when you sit down. The Employee Retention Credit is the shot chaser that comes <laughs> after it. And what Good occurred analogy. when 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 Biden expanded the employee retention credit created out of the CARES Act to have employers who retained employees during COVID, even though their business was interrupted, you couldn't double dip, by the way, most people are, but you could not double dip with the Paycheck Protection Program loan and the employee retention credit. But we've seen a wave of people doing just that. So what began with 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 the the legislation that Trump signed into law with the CARES Act, it's about up to $21,000 of payroll taxes that you could claw back if your business is interrupted in the year 2020. That was expanded by the Biden administration in 2021 to encompass not just companies that had their businesses interrupted also through the third quarter of 2021, but also miraculous phoenixes rising out of the ashes in the form of startups that were created because of the pandemic. Yeah. God bless America. So how much easier, oh, and by the way, up to $26,000 per employee that you could claw back. So miracle of miracles, I know you won't believe it, Adam, but startups took off for the races. And the IRS is wise to the fact that most 99% of companies that were going to, to claim this employee retention credit have long since done so and paid out. And yeah, I, I joke about Kevin O'Leary, but he's only on financial media every 15 minutes you know, with, with clockwork because he's actively advertising, quote unquote, don't leave your money on the table 
He's joined by GetRefunds.com, Innovation Taxes. People, most people have heard of Wonder Trust. Most people have heard of GetRefunds.com, but they don't connect it to a government program that if you had paid out July's $30 billion per month, would have pumped $400 billion into the US economy on an annualized run rate. It's about one and a half percentage points of GDP, but it has been putting in 15, 20, 28, 25 billion dollars a month into the U.S. economy, in addition to the infrastructure spending that was coming out of the fiscal side. And it's it's little wonder that the U.S. economy hasn't gone into recession because this employee retention credit uh, that is not even, even uh, for accounting purposes, a, a government transfer, it's simply reduced income taxes paid for the purpose of Uncle Sam's accounting, but it's pumped billions of dollars into the hands of well-to-do Americans who've taken advantage of the system. So I write about it often. I'm publishing on it this week again, because my hat's off to the IRS. When would I ever say that? <laughs> uh, they have approached Congress and asked for an early end to this program that they have acknowledged is probably now predominantly fraudulent claims. And that is going to leave a dent. Okay. In consumer spending, I would remind you very simple, write this one down, folks, the top quintile of income earners in the United States of America account for more than 40% of U.S. consumption, which is 70% of U.S. GDP and 18% of global GDP. You take money away from that cohort, you're going to see it show up in reduced consumption. All right. So we've had this stealth stimulus going on through this program. Uh, that not many people have been aware of. It's been largely going into the pockets of the top 20%, as you mentioned. So it's been unfair, uh, unjust in terms of who's benefiting and who's not. Um, that has been helping stoke consumption. You know, we're a 70% consumer driven economy. And you're basically saying that money spigot's getting turned off now or is in the process of getting wound down. And if the IRS has its way, it may be fully shut off. Um, and that that is another one of these shoes to drop that you mentioned earlier, sort of in your perfect storm list of things that are going to dampen the economy going forward. You're nodding as I'm saying all of this. Yeah, so, you, you've uh, just rattled off one, two and three. The bankruptcy cycle has resurged. The layoff cycle and closing down of locations has also resurged and a large source of income for your highest propensity to spend Americans has also been crimped. Okay. So I've I've made a dad joke on this channel several times that I'm going to change my my name to Adam Laggart uh just to help people really reinforce the the understanding that the lag effect is real and even if it hasn't fully manifested yet it is going to we haven't dodged that bullet the no landing scenario is highly unlikely to put it gently. Um I believe you're in this camp, correct? <laughs> I'm definitely in this camp. Uh, I, I understand that that Wall Street has its own much bigger camp, but um, that that's okay, Adam. We can go off and have a camp of our own. Oh gosh, if I'm in a camp with you, Danielle, I don't care who. I don't care where anybody else well, is, as long as, long as I'm in the same it, camp. It will be a glamp. So, anyways, yes, a glamp. I love it better. All right. Um, well, look. So, a couple other things wrapped up in this, um, and thank you because you're taking this exactly where I want to go. Um, Let's get back to the Fed for a moment. Um, you know, Powell has been as consistent as he has been, like him or not, because he sees his job as getting inflation under control, right? Killing that inflation dragon. And in his mind, you know, he has defined that as back to 2%. Uh, and there's a lot of chatter right now, you know, trial balloons maybe being floated by Larry Summers and others that, well, maybe we rise it up to 3% and then we can just sort of declare mission accomplished and move on with our lives, right? Powell is not saying that, at least not yet. So first question for you is, is how likely do you think he's going to, has, how successful is he going to be in taming inflation from here? Because you mentioned his focus on services inflation, and that's where the sticky stuff is. And we have all this other stuff coming down that you've mentioned. Um, but it is pretty sticky. And I'm wondering, I've posited, are we potentially seeing the Pareto principle where the, the first 80% was the easy stuff to get rid of and the remaining 20% is the hard stuff to get rid of? So could this last, could this inflation battle last longer than folks are expecting? Or do you expect them to be successful in the shorter term? 
So it's not so much that I expect Powell to be successful because he's netting shelter out of his calculus. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, then you're going to have the portion that remains, which does include health care, which is 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 poised to reaccelerate. Yep. You are going to have that as an offsetting factor going forward. If you're even if you're you're just looking at the at the CPI at the headline level, but we have to bear in mind that shelter is twice the weight of healthcare mm -hmm. in the CPI. So I I I do think that he's going to be able to get inflation under control the way the average American reads the headlines. Does that mean that a loaf of bread or a gallon of milk is not, is not appreciably more expensive than it was prior to the pandemic? Yeah, that that's absolutely correct. But I think that the headline and core CPI as reported. I don't think he's going to have trouble getting them back down towards the 2% level. Well, okay. his core net core service is net of shelter. It is actually never really, it's designed to never be negative. So as long as he focuses just on that, but he's going to have some pretty mad politicians as a factor of time going forward. Okay. So the, I guess the spirit of my question was, I hate to ask when, because it's unknowable, but sort of like, how long do you think it's going to take for him to get to a point where he can say my job is done? Well, I think that that when you start to see because of this confluence of factors that's going to have um, that, that's going to have an arresting effect on consumption into the U.S. holidays. So those are some big headline makers. So I think that once you have the pressure really tick up going into the election year, that he is going to be increasingly pressured to say my job is done because you're going to see after the base effects come in and out over the next few months, you're going to see that inflation number coming down. I'm knocking on wood, but that's what we're seeing right now, Adam. So will he say mission accomplished with an asterisk, but not by my measure? It's going to be difficult to do, but that's why he's laying the groundwork for lowering the Fed funds rate in 2024, but by the same token, also saying I can continue to shrink the balance sheet at the same time right. because I proven my metal. I can run parallel policy successfully. All right. Uh, okay. So this is really getting into the meat of it then. So um, uh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make some statements, qualify them any way you like. Um, but I believe you and I look at it similarly, where the risk here, especially given how the indicators that Powell is choosing to look at, the risk here is that the Fed may actually be over tightening, right? Um, policy may be too aggressive, given where things are going to go anyways, given the lag effects that we're talking about. You're, you're nodding as I'm saying this. Um, and so I guess it's probably up for grabs at this point, whether Powell is able to get to a point where he says, my job is done, or he just says, I have to stop going down that path because things important enough things are actually breaking, that that's now my new priority, right? Um, so it sounds like you are, we're talking probabilities here. But you're of the mind that these these this perfect storm of what I like to call sort of gravitational uh, catalysts that just weigh increasingly on economic growth is going to get so high by end of this year, early 2024, that we probably are going to see a Fed pivot at some point and that um, interest rates will start making a march back down again. So in other words, getting back to my original question, folks that are now beginning to panic and say, why would anyone want to be in a long bond? I'm assuming that maybe you're thinking, actually, there's probably some good reasons to be in a long bond if you are looking out into 2024. True? I certainly think I, I would agree with that assessment, Adam. And I, I think that if you're talking about rate cuts in 2024, that that is, that, that is your highest probability outcome. But again, he has reiterated what Lori Logan of the New York Fed, a lifetime Fed economist who's now the president of the Dallas Fed, what she posited recently uh, in a speech was that the Fed could, again, run parallel policy, reduce the federal funds rate at the same time that they continue to run off the balance sheet, which is it's its own form of tightening. My mentor, Dr. Dr. Lacey Hunt, would tell you that other deposits in U.S. commercial bank liabilities hit a cycle low in the latest uh, weekly uh, take on that in the Fed's H8, that will continue, and it will continue to have a disinflationary impact on financial assets. 
It will continue to be a thorn in the side of CFOs who need to refinance. It won't matter to them that the Fed has stopped lowering rates or started to nudge rates down a little bit here and there if they're still looking at at least a doubling in their financing costs when that time comes in 2024. Because again, the Fed's continuing to deplete liquidity. The Dallas Fed has a banking survey. It, sh it shows it just a few days ago, we found that there was an eighth consecutive month of decreased demand for loans. We can't ignore things like that, especially because we still have banks that are that are clearly in distress, according to first Moody's, then Fitch, and now Standard & Poor's. All right. So let's peel this back. So this is super interesting. So one of my questions for you is, is can the economy sustain the current cost of capital we have? I think I, I think you're thinking not for long. Right. And um, what's interesting is the Fed could cut rates. I mean, it could cut from five and a quarter down to three. Right. And and yet we have all these corporations that are going to they, they, they borrowed when debt was cheap. Right. And that's what a lot of them have been existing on, especially the zombie ones. They're going to have to basically refinance when that debt matures, even at 3%, right? So if the Fed is cut materially, even at 3%, that's still a really big <laughs> increase in cost of capital for these companies. So unless the Fed like has a, a massive turnaround where it, it literally just goes back down to close to ZERP very quickly, we're going to have additional injuries as time goes on and companies have to, to re-rate here. So I totally get what you're saying about... We're going to be feeling the impacts of these higher this higher cost of capital for a good period of time here, um, and certainly if the Fed continues QT, even if it's lowering rates, that'll that'll compound issues here going on here. One question I have for you about this, and you've been nodding, so I'm assuming you're agreeing with what I said, but if not, clarify. Um, there is a difference between corporate bonds and U.S. government bonds, and in the example that I mentioned, um, where uh, you know, interest rates are coming, the federal funds rate is coming down. Do you, I guess where I'm going is, is, do you think U.S. treasuries are attractive here? Because that's the big debate that's going on right now. And I think if the Fed does begin to bring rates down, that'll probably be positive for U.S. treasuries, especially long dated, dated duration ones in the environment we're talking about. But if you have a different opinion, please, please let me know. I don't want to mischaracterize you. No, no, I, I don't have a diff different opinion. And again, it's predicated on the fact that I think fundamentals will begin to matter. And I count one of those fundamentals as a company that is not able to refinance. That has a fundamental impact on the economy in that if yep. they cannot refinance, they're not in business, they're not creating paychecks. And that is a very fundamental event for the market every time we see a company go, every time we see a Walgreens location close, every time we see um, a PNC bank branch close, that has a material impact on the income generating capacity of the US workforce. All right, so let's huddle around the campfire in our glamp here, okay? Uh, so we're on, you know, believe recession is much more likely than the, the no landing, uh, folks over in that other no landing camp, right? So how bad, Danielle? You know, I know I know you like me really kind of take all this down towards the employment situation and and what then happens with layoffs because we've been around the block enough to see some of the, the larger, more recent recessions that have had you know layoffs in the millions, and we've seen the collateral damage of that. Um, for this type of environment that you see coming here, what what do you think it's going to be like for most folks' lived experience? Is it going to be like a like a 2008 style one with that much uh, job loss? Uh, will it be shorter? Will it be more prolonged? What, what, what are you seeing right now in the tea leaves you're looking at? So I think what we have ahead of us is not necessarily the violence uh, in terms of the delta decline in GDP, but much more so the persistence of the U.S. economy in an environment where there's no growth or or, or contracting uh, GDP. And one of the reasons that I see the persistent nature of what's to come is the different cohorts who are, who are living based on extending and pretending. So I, I specifically reference uh, bank loan officers, as well as individuals who are dangling by a thread holding on to investments in residential real estate. Because when you say that the narrative has flipped to a pivot, 
when people say pivot, they mean zero interest rate policy. Hmm. That's how a pivot is defined because a lot of people are not gonna be able to crawl out of the hole they're in unless the Fed goes straight back down to the zero bound. As, as you said, if you're talking about you know the difference between 0% and 3%, well, that's the difference between a life and a death right. when it comes to the corporate landscape. And that's material. Uh, if you haven't already interviewed her, I can't believe I'm plugging somebody, but she's just fabulous, Melody Wright. And she she's on the ground going from community to community all across the United States looking at the sheer number of vacant investment properties and also noting that a lot of the home builders are sitting on spec homes that are not even being listed right now. Mm -hmm. they're, waiting, they're waiting for January of 2024 to reclassify them as land that they're building on, even though you could move in tomorrow compared to a, a, a property that has to be property taxed. Uh, hoping again that the Fed pivots all the way down to where they get to quit buying down points one at a time at a time because their margins are getting squeezed to where we can reintroduce the two and a half percent mortgage. Yay. But again, there are too many different players in the economy that are hoping for zero interest rate policy when they think of the idea of, of pivoting as well as quantitative easing as a nice little icing on the cake. Yeah, it. yeah. and you're making me think too about, um, you know, the the auto manufacturers and dealers that have, you know, those armies, and fleets of cars that are like parked around racetracks that aren't being used and whatnot. Because again, they're waiting for better financing terms to come out, right? They don't want to flood the market and depress prices right now. So there's just so much of that going on. Um, uh, so, okay. So, and by the way, um, I do follow Melody on Twitter. I haven't interviewed her on this channel. So I've just taken down a note to send her an invitation. I'll let her know that you are the one who who, who made the plug. Um, so like funny, Daniel, we, we hadn't before this sentence, you know, talked about housing, right? I mean, talk about people that are praying for a return to ZERP, right? <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, the sheer number of individuals who are being highlighted, and I feel badly for these people, on on social media who are saying i absolutely have got to get out from under the yoke of this this investment property but you know, the purchases were made based on weekly weekly cash flow assumptions not monthly but what am i going to be able to generate even if i'm across the country buying a, a, a property that's thousands of miles away what does airbnb suggest that i'm going to be able to generate off of this property so that i can create this nice flow of cash uh, nice flow of income for myself well you know, these were not mortgages that were designed to be put on hold for 12 months while while domestic travel, whether you're listening to Alaska or Southwest Airlines or JetBlue, while domestic travel clearly takes it on the chin and, and the employee retention credit sent people off to Gay Paris and they were all doing all this international travel. But you know, if if what looks to be occurring is occurring and what's the 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 impact on domestic travel and on Airbnb, there's more shadow inventory out there and you can shake a stick at. And in addition to that, we've got all these apartments coming online and we have all of these home builders building spec homes as, as quickly as they can. So I understand that it's really awesome to talk about, you know, the number of properties that are not on the market. But, you know, to, to reference Melody Wright going to this one community where 55 plus um, aged people literally went into a near riot because their homeowners association fees were rising because insurance premiums were going so much uh, up so much in the state of Florida. Well, you know, as things turned out, she looked into this one little community where on the community's website, there were a hundred listings for purchases and rentals. And you look on MLS, you look on realtor.com, 16, one six. So I think that 18 months from now, 12 months from now, we're going to be talking about the shadow inventory that was you know, not some boogeyman that keeping Danielle up at night, but that was a real thing building into a, if it's not saved by zero interest rate policy and the resumption of QE, where are we going to be in terms of, oh my gosh, there's too many homes out there. Yeah. Uh, gosh. I mean, we could make this entire discussion just about what's going on in the real estate market. Um, so uh, let me try to just wrap it up in the sense of a little good. Right. I mean, it, at least until 
mortgage Adam, rates come, I'm, come I'm back. I'm interrupting you for a second, Adam. Yes. You, you're, you're like, I'm James Joyce, and then you have to riddle in Danielle. Anyways, continue. Okay. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, you, you're, you're, you're knocking out of the park with the analogies today, Danielle. Let's put it that way. <laughs> um, so, uh, but but nothing nothing good, at least until mortgage rates like really come down substantially. There doesn't seem to be a lot of reasons to have a ton of hope for that anytime soon. Um so, uh, and we didn't really even talk about commercial real estate, which is an even worse situation. I mean, it, it's 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 bad. It's really bad now, right? I live out in the San Francisco Bay Area. You know, we've got really big property owners in San Francisco that are jingle mailing, you know, hotels and massive office buildings, right, back to the banks. Uh, so it's already started in earnest here. So, okay, so we have all of this coming drag effect from the lags that we've been talking about that's going to hit the economy. Um, presumably, we haven't mentioned this specifically, but I'll, I'll give you a chance to opine on it. That is going to lead to an earnings recession, right, in corporate America. That is then going to trigger layoffs. Uh, that is obviously going to be really bad for the housing market, right, because you're going to have a lot of people lose the incomes that they're currently using to pay today's housing prices. So therefore, that should make the housing price correction really kick on in earnest. If I heard you correctly, you don't see this as like a tree falling. In other words, it's a it's a short, sharp event. You see this as like a slow grind, just rolling thunder happening over quarters, probably years. Correct me if that's wrong. Um, so I'm kind of taking it, if I wrap everything up in a bow from you, as kind of like this is a gird your loins moment where, you know, we really need to be thinking ahead and saying, OK, you know, if I work for a living, if I work for a paycheck, you know, how should I be thinking about what's going to happen to me if my employer struggles, if I get a pink slip, et cetera, if I'm if I'm a homeowner and I, I have a lot of equity in my home, I got to make some decisions pretty quick. Right. You know, do I sell and pocket what I have? Or do I risk maybe writing this thing down uh, over the period you, you, you're talking about here? Obviously, from an investment standpoint, and we'll talk about this in just a second, but you got to ask, okay, great. What, what investments make sense for this type of, of future? So before we get to that part of the conversation, did I summarize kind of your general outlook correctly there? Yes, Adam, you did a very, very good job. So okay. You are the well, riddler. All right. Well, <laughs> no, not at all. Um, okay. So uh, then let's move to that last question, which is, okay, you sort of market outlook. So first, how do you expect the financial markets to react as this, the, the rolling thunder of the storm really begins to build momentum? So I, I think that the, 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 the biggest exacerbating factor is the realization that most pension, public pension fund managers came to a long time ago. They can sit on the sidelines in this kind of an environment. And I think that that realization is coming to individual investors at a much slower rate that, you know, I can I can go over here and eat popcorn and sleep well at night and collect 6% on my money. And that, I you know, I, I could be okay with that. I'll sit on my and, and maybe have some upside if you believe the, the bond story that we've just been talking about, right? Like I can get paid in safety and it might make money over time. Appreciate it. Potentially that that that's your kicker, but I'm talking about very short term. Yeah. Uh, here, that if you know if you wanted to take an 18 month break, you know you you will be very well compensated for just sitting back and seeing you know how the leaves end up falling off the trees as opposed to the tree itself falling over, as you said. Mm -hmm. So there's that that optionality is there, and the reason I don't think we've seen more of a shift out of the stock market and into risk-free alternatives is because you have baby boomers especially, you have an entire generation and a generation behind them who've been told always leave the vast majority of your money inside the stock market. It is where you have to be for the long term. And to you know to the credit of the RIA community, this you know this type of brainwashing is ingrained in individual investors. Uh, but right. so, so, sorry to interrupt, but, but you know, yeah. with a huge amount of help from the Fed, right? That strategy works great well, I mean, in a ZERP environment, always, right? The Fed's always been lower for longer. You know, zero interest rates were always going to come to the rescue. The Fed's always going to keep your, and, and it's, you know, if, if don't, don't take my word for it. You know, look on my Twitter feed. Jay Powell has been resolute since January of 2022. But yet I have the same exact people saying that he's going to cave tomorrow. Yeah. And, you know, we're 
how long into this since January of 2022? And they're like, they've been wrong for a year and a half. It's amazing to me. They're like, they, they, the market has always had to like, shift. The market has always had to shift this expectation, right? Jay Powell, okay, now he's he's holding steady. I got to shift, right? And yet this year, stocks have continued to climb higher, right? It's just, it's it's been amazing. And I do think 2024 will be the year of descent for Jay Powell. I'm not saying that he's going to be able to, to continue at this game forever. And, and you're seeing definitely the doves get louder on his federal open market committee. But even so, there's still time into the future for him to, to hold his ground and continue to disprove the zero interest rate QE tomorrow crowds. So, you know, what I find so interesting about this point is um, it shows you how, like, how long the herd is willing to be wrong for, right? It, it takes a long time for mass psychology to shift, right? And and then when it does, you know, it shifts all at once, right? And, and so where I think opportunity lies right now, and tell me if you agree or disagree, is those that are paying attention, we can see increasingly that the herd is losing confidence, but it hasn't shifted behavior yet, right? So if you bolt from the horde early, position where the herd is going to go, you have the petition that you, you've got a lot of probability to not experience the injury that the herd may very well experience, and then benefit from the capital of the herd rushing into where you've pre-positioned yourself. But the only thing you have to get in front of is that cousin of yours who's going to be talking about artificial intelligence stocks at Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> yeah. Because that's going to be your moment. It's when America comes together and the financial markets close and everybody sits around the turkey and starts to talk. And it's when that realization moment is there, when your Thanksgiving's early this year, when you're six, seven weeks into kind of this October the 1st you know, budget standoff, this October the 1st resumption of student loan payments, the employee retention credit really not being the, the, the factor that it was turbocharging consumption. It's at Thanksgiving 2023, really, that the discussion we're having today is going to be had all across America. All right. So, folks, use this as your opportunity. Use the time you have now wisely. So uh, just in terms of, of, you know, actionable ideas, um, are there any asset classes that you feel particularly good about in this environment? And then there are, are there others that you just wouldn't touch with a 20 foot pole? Given what we've talked about so far, I might put US treasuries, certainly US T-bills in your good bucket. And I probably would put AI stocks in your don't touch bucket. You would certainly put those in my don't touch bucket. That is correct. Uh, yeah. and I, I would be very wary at this juncture also uh, of anything on the cusp because we are seeing the insolvency cycle as we are. So I'd be very careful right now about whether or not you've got exposure to CLOs or high yield um, or even investment grade that, that is full of companies that might become you know tomorrow's fallen angel. I'd be very careful here. Okay, um, great. All right, well, look, um, uh, I know that you're continue to be very busy writing reports there at Quill Intelligence. Uh, in just a second, I'm going to ask you where folks can go and follow you and your work. Beyond the, the ERC article that you're working on, is there anything else that you've got your eye particularly fixated on that we haven't talked about yet in this conversation? Um, so I, I think that there is always something to be said when you're looking at financial planning, Adam, for states that are doing the right thing. So if we're at a turning point in the kind of the longer maturity interest rate cycle, then I would be talking to my financial advisor about what states and municipalities have been doing things right and where opportunities might be uh, on an after-tax basis going forward. Nobody knows the outcome of elections, but it's always good to be positioned either way in terms of their outcome. So I would add that. And is that sort of with an eye towards muni bonds at some point in time in good states or yes i, I guess i i'm definitely referring to municipal bonds in well-run states okay great all right and that's a, a nice little uh advanced uh commercial for the my general message in every one of these videos is that most folks should be working in partnership with a good financial advisor who understands all the issues you've talked about here danielle which is a very rarefied class there aren't very many <laughs> financial advisors that talk about the things that we do. Sadly, they're, they're still stuck in the old 
model of, hey, the Fed's going to come to the rescue and just buy the dip and hold forever. And I NVIDIA, everything will be fine. No everything offense. will be fine. No offense. Uh, all right. Well, look, um, as always, Danielle, you never disappoint. This has been a fantastic discussion. You always leave it all on the playing field. Um, I've really enjoyed the time with you in our glamping circle here. For folks that would like to join the circle and follow you in your work, where's the best places for them to do that? So I'm fairly new to the Substack platform. So love to have you come over and have a look at uh, demartinobooth.substack.com. Uh, you know, as, as Adam, you're saying, we, we publish every day. And on the institutional side, there'll also be information for how to uh, to click through if, if you run money for a living and you want to get in with the QI Pro crowd, we'd be happy to join you. Our Bloomberg chat room's open. Awesome. And I just got to make a plug, too, for your Twitter account. Uh, you are incredibly active on that and incredibly generous in sharing what's going on in your brain throughout the day. Uh, I think it was someone who said it's it's like a free MBA, you know, on Twitter. So uh, you're still active there, correct? Absolutely. I, I definitely still am. And at all hours of the day, it would seem. So I think I I think I've learned how to tweet in my sleep. All right. I think so, too. And what's your what's your Twitter handle? At Demartino Booth. OK, great. Danielle, when we edit this, as, as we always do when you're on, we'll overlay the handles and the URL to your Substack. Uh, on the screen so that folks know where to go. We'll also put links in the description below, folks, if you want to go check those out, which I highly, highly recommend you do. All right. Well, I'm beginning to bring things to a close here. I just want to remind everybody that the uh, Wealthy on Fall online conference has uh, just had its tickets go on sale. Uh, they're on sale at the early bird price, which is th almost 30% off uh, the full price for tickets. So if you're interested uh, in uh, checking out the conference and securing that low price, I uh, highly recommend you go do so. Just really quickly, let me give you a sense of who actually is going to be in the conference. Um, it's going to be kicked off by Lacey Hunt. Uh, keynote and uh, hero of Danielle. Uh, she mentioned Lacey earlier by name. Uh, Lacey's presentations are phenomenal, just data packed, chart rich. They are definitely worth the entire cost uh, of the conference just in and of Lacey's single presentation. Uh, we're going to have Jim Grant there, uh, probably the world's greatest expert on interest rates alive, uh, sharing his outlook uh, with us on interest rates. We're going to have Michael Kantrowitz there talking about his HOPE framework, which will very uh, laser focus in on the employment situation. That's the E in the HOPE framework. Um, we're going to have Kyle Bass there talking about the biggest geopolitical risks that could uh, affect the global economy next year. Uh, we'll have Stephanie Pomboy there talking about uh, the forces of inflation and deflation and how they are likely to increasingly collide going forward, which ones will win out. Um, Ivy Zellman will be there. Um, she's one of the nation's top real estate analysts, so she'll be giving us her outlook for both uh, residential and commercial real estate going forward. Uh, that'll be moderated as well by uh, Amy Nixon and Nick Jurley, uh, other, those other housing experts you've, you've seen on this channel before. Um, we're going to have Michael Leibowitz uh, talking about bonds and giving his outlook for bonds uh, for 2024. Rick Rule will be there sharing his top stock picks uh, in the natural resources space. Um, we'll also, on the energy side, we'll have Doomberg there talking about the global energy situation. He'll then be joined in a panel with Justin Hewn uh, to do a deep dive specifically in the emerging, uh, many emerging opportunities that are appearing in the investing in nuclear energy space. And of course, uh, we're going to have all of our financial advisors available throughout the day so you can ask, whatever them, uh, ask of them whatever questions you have. So to uh, learn more and sign up for that conference and secure the early bird discount price, just go to Wealthion dot com slash conference. And if you've attended one of those conferences in the past, check your email because we've emailed all of our past conference alumni with an additional 15% discount code to use on top of the 30% uh, early bird price discount. So we really want to make sure that you guys get the best price for this event as possible. And as Danielle and I mentioned, I um, highly recommend that folks work under the, uh, the guidance of a professional financial advisor as you are looking towards the end of the year and looking into next year in terms of how you want to position your portfolio and your wealth. If you've got a good one who is doing that for you and is taking into account all the things that, that Danielle and I talked about in this video, great, stick with them. They are incredibly rare. But if you don't, or if you'd like a second opinion from one who does, um, then feel, uh, consider to uh, schedule a free consultation with one of the financial advisors that Wealthion endorses. To do that, just fill out the short form at Wealthion.com. Uh, these consultations uh, don't cost anything. 
Um, there's no commitment to work with these advisors. It's just a free public service they offer to help as many people position as prudently as possible in advance of this potential perfect storm that Danielle just mentioned. All right, folks, Danielle, it's been wonderful as always having you on this channel. You do such a wonderful job. You always leave it all on the playing field. Thank you for that. Folks, if you'd like to see Danielle come back on the channel again in the future, please do us a favor, encourage her to do that by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Danielle, it's been a total pleasure. Everyone else, thanks so much for watching.